I'm live now. I'm just playing. We live now. Yeah, you know, no, no kidding. It's, 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 it's live. It's live. Let, let's let's um let's give uh I got you. I got you. Um, let's give uh, a moment or two to like, share, and subscribe. That's 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 basically what I want to do. Kind of to start us out. As you see, uh, Eric Cafe talks about our time with Lorenzo Campbell and Irving. If you haven't already, like, share, subscribe. Let's give you, I'm gonna give you a moment or two to do that. That could that's important. That allows all the other videos to go to the bottom and for this video to come up top. That's basically what we're trying to do here. Have you liked it? I'm talking about you. Like it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Thank you for liking it for those that have. Um, if you ever listen to our, our conversations, uh, me and Eric basically talk about some experiences uh, that we've had in the past and our previous time organizing, which I think is important. Uh, more so like a, a digital memoir of our experiences, um, you know. So for the you know, so that's that's basically the purpose of our conversation. And one person that we met a, a amongst our travels uh, was a comrade, brother, an elder by the name of Lorenzo Camboa Irvin, and his wife, Jonana Irvin who uh, were great examples of uh, revolutionaries um, that were willing to share information uh, with us. And over a few day period, were able to mentor us, or at least have us understand um, their perspectives. Now to give the, the backdrop of that, um, or some history on that uh, before Chairman Eric talks. Uh, Lorenzo Camboa Irvin, Jonana Irvin, and the comrades that work and organize with them on a daily basis had heard about some of the works that we were doing in Dallas, Texas. So they had actually heard about us, more so probably seen us on social media. Uh, both of them are on social media. And both of them are avid writers and you know dedicated to that sort of work about getting information out. And so they had seen us online and you know, some kind of way on one or the other side, there was some communication that was that was done. I don't know if it was with myself or Rock Kim. I think it was with me initially. And we decided we was gonna bring them to Dallas. Now at that particular time. They lived in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and if you're familiar with Memphis, Tennessee, you know how life in Memphis can be. And so they was cool and calm about the ideas of coming to Dallas. And so that's where we more so kind of, you know, got our bones in with them and had some pretty good conversation. Now, just keep in mind, I did give like a, a brief bio. I, would, I shouldn't say a bio, just a brief detail about... Uh, Mr. Camboa's previous time organizing as a youth um, and also other interesting details. But without further ado, um, you know, bring Chairman Eric and have him talk about, you know, um, in, from his perspective, uh, what our time with Lorenzo Camboa Irvin and his wife, Jonana, meant and how that helped develop us as revolutionaries and ultimately a uh, guerrilla mainframe as a whole and has set us apart even in our current organizing positions as currently. So go ahead, Eric, kind of kind of let us know. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's a um, lot you could discuss. Yeah, there's a lot we could talk about as far as the, when they came uh, here to Dallas from Memphis. Um, you know, uh, at that time, you know, you should, last week we, we, you discussed, you know, we, we showed the video back when Chairman Fred was here. 
uh, you know, dealing with the dead time and the height. Well, it's not, it's always the height of police terrorism, but police terrorism around the country really being discussed in printed panels and people, uh, uh, you know, trying to lobby for the system to change its approach when it comes to police and relationship to our community with all the murders and things like that. <clears throat> um, but um, we consider ourselves pretty, you know, diverse as organizations. So we didn't just want to touch on that. We want to bring people in and, you know, to talk about other things. And so, you know, bringing Joe Nana and, and Lorenzo in, uh, you know, uh, we, we got, we, we can put uh, Ross Mounier in there too, you know, for a revolutionary comrade too. He, he, he in Canada. But uh, him and his wife, you know what I'm saying? They for came sure. also. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So we were bringing all these elders in to bridge that gap, uh, which the gap has already been bridged with a lot of revolutionaries that are our age and younger. You know, the gap has already been bridged because we know that, you know, we have to deal with our elders, political prisoners, prisoners of war, and even elders that's out out and about like us, um, you know, we have to build that relationship with them, you know, because you can't be serious if you don't have bridge that gap. You know, I think some of the people that were after our movement, you know, maybe in the, in the, in the current stage, you know, just coming up 20s, you know, 30s or whatnot, they, you know, I think, uh, or I know a lot of them made a mistake. You know, one of the errors that they made is that they think they know it all. They don't want to get with any elders and things like that. You can read a book all day long. You know, um, that don't that don't give you the experience of building a bond with an elder who had, you know, a firsthand experience in the revolutionary process of their time and their day, and who are continuing that process with us right now. You know, it's not like it. You can read all day long. You know, a lot of, you know. People in our generation, they love to quote the side of Shakur, you know, quotes, you know, uh, you know, about the change, you know, we don't have nothing to lose with our change and stuff like that. And so, but a lot of them couldn't tell you about a side for real, you know what I'm saying? And so it, it's just something that sounds cool and make you feel like you're revolutionary. But when it comes to building with the elders, they laid the path, right? The, they, gave, <clears throat> they gave us the blueprint. When it comes to them, you know, a lot of them sitting on the side, they don't even, you know, they don't, you know, they're not making an effort to reach out to them and say, hey, I still need apprenticeship. Just because I read your book, don't, that don't have nothing to do with anything, you know, you know, don't have anything to do with what's going on right now per se when it comes to just mentorship, one-on-one -on -one mentorship, things of that nature. Because some of the people that's in the books are ancestors now. And so, you know, we always made the effort to, you know, get with the elders and build a bond and relationship with them and and to pass it on to our generation and the people that were behind us and to let them hear about their perspective and their analysis uh, on the revolutionary movement and what we have going in the United States all together. And so we brought them to, you know, for that reason. You know, uh, I cannot remember the title, I know we had a headliner because we do, we push a headliner, we push it online, we go out in the community, we push the, push the flyer and whatnot, but I don't remember the headliner, you know, um, you know, but I can, I can definitely, you know, discuss what was talked about, you know, and if anybody have looked at any YouTube videos or read, you know, his book, you know, uh, you know, his latest book, then you know kind of where he goes when you talk, you know. Um, and so that's it's kind of what he did there, you know, him and his wife, Jonana Irvin, who was the last editor of the Black Panther Party Receptor Fence newspaper, was his wife. And uh, of course, he was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, he was out of Chattanooga, Chattanooga Tennessee with Wakasa Ricks. And then later on, you know, he became, uh, for a brief period, a part of the Black Panther Party for self defense and became exiled and in prison overseas and things of that nature. Uh, came back here and, <clears throat> you know, examined why he was there. And after that, he examined, which is what you're supposed to do. You know, we have a number of people from back then and even in our generation, they regurgitate the same old, same old thing. 
there's nothing wrong with that. Those are the principles and the foundation they were they were given, or they had learned, or they were taught. But you have to adapt, right? You have to you have to constantly see where progress can be made, right? You have to constantly have an you know analyze, right? What's going on? What needs to be tuned, fine tuned? What needs to be you know worked on? And so you know uh, he he adopted the philosophy that he feels is the next level, which is uh, anarchism, you know, socialist anarchism, anarchism, but anarchism is the end goal nevertheless. You know, more like a stateless socialism, right? Without a state, a hierarchy, you know, um, that controls everything. Uh, and so, you know, that's just, and, and we say that, that's not, as he would talk about, that's not the philosophy of anarchism that people think about as it was when he first got into it, right? Is and that and that was, you know, the outlook of anarchism was that, you know, there's a bunch of, you know, white, white, young white people that's uh, Mexicans or whoever, black people that's out, they tearing up shit, you know, doing a protest, they burning shit, you know, they might even fire a shot or two, you know, they just roll, they just throwing out. And people look at anarchism like it's chaos. It's 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 it's, it's, it's is is free for all. There's no structure there. And Lorenzo uh, have been great at articulating just the opposite of what people think about it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and so on his panel, he didn't really just go into that, but he mostly went into where, you know, the experience he had, where we are right now, what con contributions he wants to make as an elder, and how he wants to build, you know, with, you know, people in our age group and continue uh, the process. That's deep. That's deep. That's deep. That's most definitely uh, what he discussed at that particular time. And I, I remember, uh, I could just talk about my experience. I just remember uh, it being at Pan African, and this was uh, during a time period where it was very cold in the year because I remember shortly before that we did what we was called. Uh, food, clothes, and shelter, uh, which was a program that we pushed at that particular time. And it was very cold outside. And I think even to the point that it had ice. Um, but we did have some people that came and attended the event. And we had some mm -hmm. elders. And that's where I first, I think, where I at least first met Charles Beasley, I think, um, in the person, in the flesh, was at that particular, uh, that particular meeting. And you know, it, it was just powerful to, to talk about them. On a, on a funny note, I, I remember Rock Kim sort of having a uh, run around him and uh, I think Afro Betty and maybe a couple other people had to run around to sort of help facilitate the process and the comfortabilities of, you know, the Urbans <laughs> and their stay in Dallas. Now, I remember yeah, that, yeah. Uh, going, yeah. going to Whole Foods, you know. Um, mm -hmm expropriation you know what i mean i'll just put it straight mm -hmm. expropriation at whole foods uh just to make sure that the other comrades were you know felt a certain level of comfort um you know and that stay in dallas so you know we we were happy that they were willing to do it and like i said as you mentioned we at that particular time uh because of that later on met ross mayanga and his wife and i believe ross mayanga uh was active uh, with the L.A. chapter of the party at that particular mm -hmm. time. And I believe his wife was active with the Detroit chapter, if I, my mm -hmm. memory serves me correct. This has been several, several years ago um, since we, you know, actually seen them. And I, I recently communicated uh, with Mr. Irvin, uh, talking about some projects and things that we're working on now. So he seems to be very much so still got that revolutionary mind, which is, you know, important, you know what I mean? So he still got that lucid revolutionary mind. Uh, mm. in, in in your opinion, uh, Eric, what, what do you, what do you, well, you may have already covered this, and forgive me, I had to step away for a second. Uh, how would you define, uh, at least in your opinion, that what anarchism is? Because I know a lot of people hear about anarchism. Uh, they don't know what it is. They they think kind of what you kind of stated. Uh, yeah, uh, if you know, so what? What in your opinion? What? What exactly is anarchism? And 
uh, and tell us a little bit, if you could, about the book, if you remember the, the book that Mr. Evan wrote as well. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll step off the screen to go get it in a minute. Um, as far as anarchism, you know, it's really just, you know, having an autonomous revolutionary structure. You know, uh, timeless revolutionary struggle. You know, because we've been born and bred into what we, you know, what we, where we at right now is that we always look at things like we got to have some somebody over us, right? Um, damn it, I want to bring up a book that's coming out by Economics. I can't remember the, the person's name, but he was on uh, the Richard Wolf show, Democracy at Work. And uh, he got a book coming out called Who Needs Bosses, right? And I'm and this is economics. And the thing is that we always, like I say, we always think it's supposed to be somebody over us. And if ain't nobody over us, who's going to make the decisions for us? And the answer is your ass, you know what I'm saying? You're going to make the decisions for you. A collective body, right? A revolutionary formation, a collective body, community, nation of people making decisions. Of course, you still going to have a chain of command, you know, you know, all kingdoms have a chain of command. You're not going to ever get away from that. It's always been here as long as we know, can can remember. Uh, is, you know, as long as anything has been recorded on this planet is that we always had a chain of command and structure, right? Uh, and so even with that being said, it's still, you know, you still have to have, you know, the goal is like we I mentioned earlier, the state is socialism. Mm -hmm. Many people get mad. Oh, it's just the state. It's the, it's the state running every damn thing still. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you don't have the labor forces, the working class. You know, like I say, the labor forces, you know, um, being in charge of the, the, the facilities, the factories, right? The technology, the things that they help produce or to put together and to, and to uh, put out for people in society to use, they don't have no say so. And so these are the kind of people that need say so in society. They don't just need to be doing, making products and doing things and, 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 and doing this for somebody to get rich and to treat them like shit, you know, but they need to have control, right? They need to have say so over how these things being used. How is this technology being used? What, what our labor is being used for? How, how, how are we going to use this for the good of our people? How is, this, how is these things, these products and, 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 the, and the good things of life, how is it going to be equally distributed amongst our society? And a collective forces can't come up with those answers. Because if we see here, the dumb, these politicians in America are dumb as hell. They old as hell. And they have the interests of the uh, capitalist elite class. They just, uh, you know, they're so, you know, you know, these corporations, are, you know, I don't want to say buy them out because they've been bought out. They all have imperialist interests. Anyway, that's that's the thing. But, you know, it's just, you know, corporations are telling them what to do. The people not telling them what to do. You know, they, they come in front of the camera when it's time to for re-election. They talk all this shit. You know, da, 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 da. they sound radical as fuck. Then you look at some of the bills they introduced and you're like, what the hell is this? You know, it, you know, it, it's a total contradiction of what they say out their mouth because they don't have the interests of the people in the capitalist society. And even some societies that's built on the on the uh, principles of socialism, they may be a little uh, lack thereof as well, you know, uh, because of certain things, right? Certain aspects of society where people have a time as revolutionary structure, you know, you know, the labor force having more say so in society, uh, and you know, and things of that nature, and everybody having an equal role as far as you know how the society itself is built. Like I say, the workers are the makers of history. Um, you know, the workers are the makers of history. So we know what needs to be done. Thinking that some damn Democrat, you know, who been in office for 30, 30, 32 years, got no more shit than you, that's a damn lie. Only thing they know more than you is what's going on in the government as far as bills, laws, and, you know, what's coming what's coming about. They, they had a they have the upper hand on you as far as policy, but as far as understanding and executing what the people need as a whole to make society uh, as a you know a forward moving society as possible, as we say, a revolution a revolution is supposed to be a qualitative leap, a qualitative leap in the quality of life of everybody. As far as getting that done, 
uh, you're going to do a way better job as a working class person and as a laborer than a person who's been in office, Democrat or Republican, uh, who's been in office all this time. And that's just the facts about it. And, uh, you know, of course, the society is pushed upon us, this inferiority complex that we don't even know we have, some of us. And a dependency, a dependency on a structure that has not worked. And, and of course, the main reason it hadn't worked because it was built on slavery, and everybody knows slavery is wrong. Wow. So, so in thinking about kind of what you're stating, I was just kind of a couple of conversations just come to mind. Uh, uh, I've had conversations with people that obviously lean to the uh, on the liberal end as far as being democratic, and I've had conversations with people, and this has just happened, I guess, as of late, with folks that's dealing with the Blexit movement or folks that or black and conservative, or folks that are just kind of fed up with the Democratic Party and they're sort of pushing a little bit towards that conservative end. Like, how, what what message um, should we, as uh, you think, as far as black people, African people, or, or whatever you define, define ourselves, more Hebrew lights, what, is there a particular side of that coin that we should be more so leaning towards? Uh, Democrat, Republican, or what? Well, mm. how, how should how should we fall? Because that because that's what we hear. We hear about this two party system, mm. um, and a lot of times it's either this or that. Some people say, "Well, you all like Biden," and other people say, "Well, you mm. all, all like Trump," or whatever mm. the latest liberal is going to be ten years from now, and whatever the latest yeah. conservative is going to be ten years from now. Like, what what should our politics be, or? What's what's a good starting point for our politics in terms of moving forward as a people? Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I really wanted to talk about this with uh, some of our comrades here in Dallas who are part of the Party for Socialism and Liberation, but we can still do a part two because um, I want them to uh, discuss. I don't know if she can get on here, but Claudia. Uh, but maybe, you know, the next uh, person that they're running uh, maybe if she can't get on her, you know, maybe they can talk about her perspective, what the work she's doing, and things like that. You represent the Party for Socialism and Liberation. But anyway, we still talk about it. Um, unfortunately, well, there's a, a number of sides to it. Unfortunately, even those who have radical politics may have a chance, a better chance right now at representing, temporarily representing the Democratic Party in name rather than to be independent if they're running on a, a, a liberation platform and they want to do, you know, make necessary changes happen for the for the working class. Uh, the other side to that is, you know, is really, my, I, my thing is always this, you know, either you're going to go all the way, I mean, if you're in a, if you're in a, you know, I would relate shit back to sports because it makes sense. If you're in the football game, and I'm saying that if you're in a football game and, the, and it's 100 yards to get to the end zone, why are you? Why is your whole game plan based on getting to the 50-yard line? Get to the damn end zone. That's how you win. You got to score points. And so we have become lazy, right? We have become lazy and, and, and dependent on this system and structure. They're just going, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And so we have to decide in our mind, okay, when are we going to push independence? In the, when it comes to the political party spectrum, when are we going to push, you know, that we have a right to claim our own and to run our own and for our own to represent the interests of all of us? When are we going to get to that point? Are we going to fail say, well, you got to do Democrat because that's what, you know, that's what, that's what black folk want. They want to see a Democrat up. If you ain't that, they don't know that. And it, and it always trip me out in the presidential candidates and shit when people always say, well, I ain't gonna vote for a third party because you do that, you're gonna get votes to the Republicans. All this old bullshit, it don't make no sense. You know, all this, uh, well, if you're gonna get her party, and I tell people all the time, I vote for the person I think represents what I'm doing as a working class African in America. I don't give a damn about no boogeyman. Trump don't scare me. He didn't, he, he don't now. He, in fact, he's quite hilarious to me. Yeah, he's a good damn comedian to me. He's funny as hell. 
I'm gonna get Trump clips all day long. But he don't scare me. You know, Bandela used to say, uh, ain't no such thing as no damn super white man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There ain't no white man we all should fear. Oh, if you don't if you don't vote him out, this is what's gonna happen. Because the fact of the matter, we've been here, we've been under this structure 500 years already. If you want to, I'm counting, you know, when we come over on the Mayflower and the Good Ship Jesus. I'm not necessarily talking about that when it was uh, finalized to be the United States of America, but I'm talking about since we've been brought to uh, Spanish, you know, territory, right? That was captured by Spanish, you know, Spanish, you know, in 1526. I'm, I'm going from there. You know, in a few years, in three more years, it'll be 500 years. So we've been doing this all this time. And nobody could tell me what the Democrat or Republic have done that is so great that we must hold hold to them, right? We must hold on to them for dear life. Nobody can tell me. Nobody can tell me. You want to talk about Trump, and I'm not protecting him, but like I said, he is a comedian to me, like so many other people. But you know, you want to talk about Trump, but what has Biden done that you so in love with? He First of all, he don't even know what the fuck he is half the time. He don't know his granddaughter from a goddamn pit bull. He don't know what's going on half the time. He's just a puppet for this, this capitalist slave state. That's it. Right? And I'm saying that we got to get off of this fear factor. Fear, fear, fear. Nah, man, love cast out fear. We don't give a damn about no damn fear. We we moving based off love. Revolutionary process is love. Liberation and freedom is a process of love. We got to we got to start being more steadfast. We got to start organizing and, and looking for the greater goal. And you know and so, but it, you got to have it in your mind first. It starts in the mind. You already defeated your mind. It's over with. So as far as the political spectrum, when we should do it, I can't really say when we should do it. But I know that we got to be independent at some point. We got to claim independent, you know, uh, uh, you know, and it's other parties right now that we can claim, like the Party for Socialism Liberation. We've been organizing and showing solidarity with them. You know, they got, you know, they got people that's making great moves and have a great analysis on where the society should go, right? But because somebody's scared that the Democrats gonna get these seats, though, they, you know, they wouldn't want to deal with that. But we're looking for what the hell we gonna get out of it for real. We're looking for you know, something is going to produce. And the Democratic Republican Party has never produced uh, for, for the working class, black, brown, or whoever. You know, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's going to come a point in time. We got to, we got to, we got to represent our people independently. And we're going to have to run revolutionary forces to counteract this system. That ain't the only thing we should do. Because uh, people always say, well, you know, they, they ain't going to let you vote your way to freedom. They ain't going to let you vote about the office, yada, yada, yada. But we still have to make moves. We have to touch, we have to, you know, leave nothing untouched in this society as far as the liberation philosophy and the liberation action. We should leave nothing in this society untouched. And that's why, you know, we supported Chuck Way and others, because he wasn't the only one. You got people running right now. Uh his daughter Rukil is, is is running, right? For Senate out in you know, the Mississippi. And so we gotta support these people that we know represent our interests. It starts with that. I'm trying to see if I can find a video. Let me see if I can find a video real quick. Uh, Lorenzo Gambo or Evan. Maybe I should have um, should have um, maybe had this beforehand. Let me see if I can find something. Yeah, let me grab that book too. The hell is it down? Oh, he's probably over here, isn't it? 
You looking for it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna give us a. Uh, let me see. What is it? That's that one. So let's see here. So I just wanted to play a little bit of uh Lorenzo Campbell was there. This is an interview that he did. Uh, as you see here, called The Making of a Black Anarchist. I just want to play a little bit of his words uh, so we can kind of get a physical representation of who Lorenzo Campbell Irving is. So let's see. You can say that um, segregation was a continuing indignity. And uh, by that I mean, every day uh, it was a source of humiliation. Uh, a white man could come up and spit in your face. Uh, he could, he could, uh, you know, kill you. He, they, the, the, the white power structure in the community uh, uh, could, uh, could, and did commit all kinds of impunity uh, uh, crimes. You know, and um, for me, the thing that always stood out in my mind was um, uh, the acts of violence. When I was five years old and I was living in Chattanooga, Tennessee, mm -hmm. uh, white racists set our house on fire. Uh, we were living in a uh, majority uh, white area, actually. Uh, my my um, family uh, worked, you know, worked for a, um, um, a Catholic parochial school, and the Catholics were fairly uh, progressive in terms of, uh, you know, rights of Black people. Well, they didn't especially hate white and black people. And we were living on the grounds of this school. And um, some white, and we got out, we barely got out with our lives. We lost everything as far as the house and, and the contents. And um, so in a, in a way of speaking, you know, that is typical of the kind of things that I went through that I experienced throughout my life. Uh, that led to later the, the, the continuous living conditions that I had to live under in, in a housing project where, um, you know, it's bad enough that Black people were oppressed generally in the South, especially as they had no, no rights that white people were bound to respect. That was, what, that was what the white government and the Supreme Court had said years ago, that Black people had no rights that the white, white government and community were bound to respect. So, um, we were living under conditions really um, of extreme oppression. And, and, you know, when people don't have enough food, when they're impoverished, uh, when they're oppressed, then they also can turn against those of their own kind. And, you know, you, we see this right now in terms of, you know, shootings of Black people by other Black people, or, or we see other, other acts 
uh, of violence against you know the black community uh, in an attempt to, for instance, get rich, in, enrich themselves, or to just act out with their anger and so forth and so on. It's, it's, it's a trap, you know, the racism and the structure that racism creates, you know, it's not just as some white people, some black people would think it's just a matter of some, in somebody's head. It's actually a structure. And that's what segregation was in that period. It was a structure of racial oppression. And um, I always point out the fact that the government was doing this. This wasn't being done by uh, just, you know, a, a, a special group of, of racist whites. These people were in the government. The, the people who financed the Ku Klux Klan, I always like to point out to people that the White Citizens Council were the people who had power, who had prestige, who came from the so-called best families. Well, they would finance the Ku Klux Klan to terrorize the Black community, to try to prevent us from enjoying any uh, human or democratic rights. And so that's the 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 world I grew up in and uh, filled with terror, filled with racism, filled with violence against black people at any any time. I don't I, I'm not going to say that that has not changed. Some things have obviously changed in terms of democratic rights, but we still face the violence of the government. And I always make the point that I'm not talking about individual white people. I always make that point. I'm not, I'm not, I, I recognize a long time ago, you know, as an, when I became an activist and when somebody politically educated me, that it isn't just individual white people we're fighting. We're fighting a system where there are people profiting from our misery. There have been people profiting from the very beginning when they brought us here, well, even before they brought us here from Africa, you know, the, 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 the passage over was all about money creating an, an industry and an economy in the so-called new world. Mm -hmm. And um, so they profited from our misery. And after slavery was over, those hundreds of years of oppression, they profited from other forms of oppression linked to our condition, economic, social, political, and of course, financial. And uh, <clears throat> so the system, is, is, is the enemy. So I recognized that at a young age. I recognized by the time I was 10 years old, and fortunately I had the, the civil rights movement on television every day. I had, you know, people, young people protesting all over the, the country uh, in the 1960s. And um, young black people who uh, our families and our communities had been stifled and crushed for years terrorized that we should never stand up against white power. And you got involved at a pretty young age, right? You were, you were, mm -hmm. how old when you first would say you were getting involved in the civil rights movement? By the time I was 10 years old, uh, I was actually considering myself some sort of activist. I didn't well, fully understand what an activist was, uh, but I knew it was linked to protest. And um, and I was clearly in full protest against the uh, white power structure, which is what it was in the South. It was a white power structure, uh, and uh, the government was running. I mean, the government was running this racist system. It wasn't individual whites necessarily. Uh, you know, you had rich whites that profited from it, but you know, there was a an actual government uh, administration that right. was doing this stuff. And it's, it's important to say that because some people still are perplexed to this day. They think it was just some uh, a group of, of, of a racist like the Ku Klux Klan or, or some other group of, you know, of, of racist whites, some particular racist whites, not understanding that the entire economy and the political structure was based on our oppression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I uh, saw this as a young man and, um, responded to it, you know, also to the fact that black people at that time, well, the late 1950s and, you know, and into the 60s, you know, have been called the, uh, the radical, the black radical protest period, mm -hmm. you know, 50s, it's been generally accepted 
as that period. When we came from um, just the formative stage of fighting segregation, racial segregation, and when the racial segregationist laws were defeated, then stepped up to the idea of fighting racism and for black liberation, you know, um, in, the, in the latter stages with black power. Well, with the new civil rights movement in 1960, which was youth based, and I always make the distinction, there's two civil rights periods there in, in, in that period in the 50s and 60s. And they were not the same organization, they were not the same movement. And they didn't practice the same tactics. And um, in 60, you know, with the with the sit ins, which were occupations of, of white racist businesses, and um, and it was a challenge to the entire community from the black community. And uh, but there were young people who were not bound by the old ideas of you know, non violence. In fact, um, they had to, the the old wing had to fight to try to to keep us within the, the so-called confines. And uh, so, myself as a young person, at ten years old when the Sidians came to my city, but it was spreading all over the all over the South. We saw what was happening. My my cousin was older than I was. He was a high school student. He was in the high school, the black, the so-called black high school, that started the protests in my hometown. And um, this set off a series of events where black people all over the city uh, rose up in a form of protest uh, to, to w defend the students, but also demand the rights that they'd been denied so many years. So they jumped in in support of the students, working class black people, as well as you know young people all over the city. Whether we we're in high, we were in high school, whether we were in, in uh, junior high or or even elementary schools. We became part of that protest and went downtown and we were met by the police before we could get into town with high pressure water hoses. Uh, we were met with uh, police dogs, vicious police dogs that they loosed on us and a, uh, you know, and also tear gas bombs and, and so forth. We were met with that to try to prevent us from getting into the city center. And um, we didn't get in that day, but we kept fighting, kept fighting, kept putting pressure on the white authorities. Uh, and the police, you know, that they eventually had to um, submit, you know, to the students' original demands. Right, right. And this is how, you know, I was shaped to be a lifelong um, radical and activist. When I saw people who had been oppressed and who had been silenced and terrorized for so many So as you see here, uh, Lorenzo Cabo or Irvin kind of gave us a, a long detail on how he became active in the movement. And that was like, a, a um, I think, um, a great point that he made out that he started when he was 10 years old. He started at 10 years old being active in his community. I'm like, wow. Mm -hmm. I don't think me and you touched until we was like what nineteen or twenty. Yeah, mm -hmm. he was saying that he was saying that he was uh, realized the importance of it at ten and the power of protest. <laughs> now I hear a lot of times uh, folks in yeah. our generation speak ill of protests, demonstrations, things of that nature, but mm -hmm. protests almost become like commercials for a pending change that we're fighting for. That's what protest is. Because protest, believe it or not, makes everybody aware. And it, it, mm -hmm. it draws some concern. Now, what we do after the protest is is very is more important. But you mm -hmm. gotta have some sort of protest because that's that's kind of um, if I understood Mr. Irvin correctly, it was the protest that kind of gave him the awareness. Uh, he's. I think he stated about his older cousin at the at the black high school that they started a, a demonstrating in, in Chattanooga, and this is kind of what 
caused this this contradiction that that happened within him that he realized kind of who he was in relation uh, to the power structure, to those in power, to the city government, what have you. So I, I just really uh, thought that was, was pretty interesting and in, in what he stated. Uh, if I may ask, do you, do you have any thoughts about what he said? Uh, no, not really. Uh, <clears throat> you broke it down. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, just how it, it just always is to me how uh, how um, people got active back then. You know, you know they were yeah. You know, people got active at a young age. And, you know, you talking about somebody that age who could recognize what was going on. Now, of course, back then it was a it was a little bit easier, you know, of course. It, racism was all in your face all day, every day, you know. I mean, directly in your face, visible. I mean, it's here now. It's here now more than ever. But now, you know, you know, it's disguised, you know, behind a lot of, you know, black people, you know, you know, black people or people who come from work class background who, who have so-called success, uh, you know, economic success, really, was is all it is. Just because you got some money don't mean you successful, right? But you know, they got some economic success. So, you know, that we see that as some, you know, things are happening. And, you know, you see black people driving the nicest cars and things of that nature. And, and you know, being able to go to shopping malls and shit like that. So well, a lot of us think we have arrived, right? And so back then, you knew your ass didn't arrive, right? <laughs> You know, you knew it wasn't no, it wasn't nothing glossy about what was going on. It was right in your face all day, every day. And so, you know, uh, that's the advantage they had over our generation that it's glossed over, but it's, it's here more than any time, but it's glossed over. That did, it was more direct and in your face. And so, even a 10 year old could recognize, hey, something got to happen, you know, and, and, that, and, and that part is, is, is understandable, but. You know the encouraging part. You know, or the or the, or the uh, exceptional part is that a ten year old feels obligated to do something about what they're seeing. You know, of course, it was in your face, so you have to recognize that it's happening. But the fact that you're 10, 12 years old and you want to do something about it, you know, that's awesome. You know, that's some. You know, that, that's that's. You know, like I said, that's exceptional. You know what I'm saying? And so. You know, that's extraordinary to be that young and want to do something about, it. you know, um, you're supposed to be running around doing a whole bunch of pointless shit at that age, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But uh, instead, you're looking at what can be done in society, you know, how can we make our communities better? How can I join my cousin and other people? You know, Mikasa Riggs, because, you know, he he was close with Mikasa Riggs, you know, brother or whatever, so he know them personally, but you see people like that who are older, you getting involved, you're like, I want to do, do that too. You know, and it's hard to, you know, no disrespect to our young geniuses in this day and time, you know, who are 10 to 12 years old, but a lot of them not even thinking about anything close to that. You know what I'm saying? You, did you get a chance to grab that book? No, nah, it's in there somewhere, man. I could, it's funny. I just saw it the other day, but I don't, I'm like, where the heck is this book? And I just saw it. Like, you know, just walking the around the house. You, Oh, uh, anarchism in the Black Revolution. That's the name of it. That's the name of it. Anarchists in the Black Revolution. If you, uh, if mm -hmm. you out there, check it out. Uh, I may put a link uh, if I find the book uh, Anarchists in the Black Revolution. I'll put it uh, here so that folks can can go directly to it. I want to plug his book because we felt like it was a good book for us to delve into at the time as Gorilla Mainframe. So yeah, so that's that was a that was a good period, a good time period when we organized, uh got them folks here. They did a uh an event and some of the elder comrades of the uh the Dallas chapter original Black Panther Party came here. Uh, uh what well, came out I should say and were mm -hmm. present when Lorenzo Campbell or Irvin spoke. And so I thought that that was uh, a great event for a great experience. And I think we learned a lot. And most important thing we learned was service. And that's kind of mm -hmm. what we're doing now. Is we, we're still actively working in the community. Um, if you can, 
Um, if you'd like to donate to our work, it's dollar sign CMB Dallas. Uh, CMB as in Bravo and the as in the city Dallas. CMB Dallas on Cash App. Please donate to us. Uh, we very much so appreciate it. We got a code drive that's coming up. Um, that we're currently organizing. We got some folks that have made some donations already. So if you'd like to add yourself to that list, uh, please donate to our efforts, CMB Dallas on Cash App. Or you can definitely reach out to me, Yafel Balagoon. You can find me, for the most part, Facebook, uh, Instagram, under the same name, same spelling. And um, I'll be happy to conversate with you. Uh, if I may ask Chairman uh, Eric, uh, do you have any any like closing thoughts um, related to this subject, as far as Lorenzo Campbell or whatever? and just Black oh, yeah. or anarchism period or whatever, whatever it is? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, I didn't mention earlier that you know one of the things that was profound that you know. Is that he represent right, and that he was pushing, and it still is pushing. Uh, it's something that you know other elders that we connect with the, the most. You know, not all of them, of course, uh, but the ones we connect with the most have the same point of view and understand that he does, and he pushed that. You know, a lot of people after the you know question and answer period during that time was a very appreciative. You know, a lot of elders like man, we need. To, in fact, I remember specifically some elders I can use. And some people I said, we need to continue this. We need to keep doing this. Bring these conversations to PAC or culture chill or wherever we can go. Bring these discussions and 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 and, and the you know solidarity means together. You know, that was you know, people was, you know, saying that was a powerful night, you know. And so, but the thing that, you know, is 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 uh is always representative of him is that he's always pushing that. The people are the leadership, right? Not this code of personality. You know, he always talk against the code of personality. You know, and so do we. Not that we don't have great personalities, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We have great just greater personalities than anybody. But, you know, it's, it's not a personality-based movement. It's an organization principle-based movement. And that's what it always should have been. That's what it always should be. And that you know, the people are the makers of history, not these, not personalities, right? And we still struggle with that as a people because America, now of course not in, with revolutionary principles, but just on its own, you know, it, its own standing, right? It pushes every day, personality, personality. You know, all, you know, like right now, a lot of people worried about Will and Jada, right? And uh, I don't know what's going on with them. I don't give a damn. Is they business, whatever the hell is going on with them, Will and Jay, what happened in the past, I don't give a shit because a lot of those Hollywood, people in Hollywood, that's why they used to call it Hollywood. All them, you know, all those people in that in that space, they all do some of the same shit, so I don't give a damn. And what they got to do with you individually moving forward as a person, and what they got to do with our collective movement, and, you know, moving forward. And so, but you always, people are always in the lives of these personalities and these entertainers and quote-unquote superstars and shit like that and so even in the movement we grasp hold to that energy that vibration that culture of you know of, of looking for personalities to be this and that then when the personality shows error or contradiction or they show themselves not to be perfect then we talk in the uproar right but the thing is you should have never looked for that in that one person anyway you know even our movement is not going to be as totally flawless, but I think is to try to make it as flawless as possible and to try to be in principle form at all costs and to be in solidarity with principle unity and make serious progress at all costs, you know, and so that's our aim. And so he always stressing that, you know, he, he doesn't look at himself like he said, he don't look at himself like a legend or anything like that. You know, even though he made some radical movements, you know, uh, um, you know, some 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 very radical and aggressive moves. You know, you could say clandestine, guerrilla type moves. You know, even though he done that, he say I don't look at myself like some kind of hero or never, don't even think I ever be looked at like that. But the goal is to keep organizing and 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 to push principle unity 
and to analyze where we are and what kind of system, you know, politically and economic we really need, and it's going to make us uh, successful. And so that was that was that's one of the things that I always stood out is that, you know, um, not pushing that code of personality, pushing that we are a collective movement. You know, he was inspired by people like Ella Baker, a great black woman that they don't ever talk about doing black history. You know. Uh, and, and some of our people don't go on their own and look for this information. You know, uh, we want to talk about what's going on in Florida. But it's our job to teach our children what the hell is going on. It's not nobody else's job. You know, and so, you know, I mean, how many people send their kids to somebody else's house to get potty trained? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Can you potty train him or her for three or a couple months and then we'll come back and get them? That shit don't happen. And so it's our job. Uh, to stress the importance of history. And people like Ellen Baker, who was a great black woman, you know, who was one of the first people who challenged the leadership back in the day, right? Who challenged the leadership. Uh, and she wasn't just no old person in the community that had some street cred or some shit just talking. She was actually, you know, African woman who organized the majority of her adult life, you know, uh, and she lived all the way to her 80s. And so, she inspired the younger generation to move accordingly on a collective basis, pushing collective leadership. That's the thing that I love most about Ella Baker. She's one of my favorite people in history because she pushed collectivism, right? And that's what we always push. We never try to make nobody no, no personality. You know, we always push the collectivism. And, and so she pushed that among the youth. She was telling them, don't follow these preachers. Don't follow. And she was... You know, she helped build a, stu you know, the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. But she was telling the youth, don't, don't rely on that. It's a, it's an aspect of our liberation movement. They're not even looking at in a Southern Christian Leadership Conference and any other movement. So it's your job to analyze where you are as a young person and organize collectively to really make some great change in this society. And she was right. She was right all the time, and that's what happened. And people like Charles Beasley. Did. You know, and all those people, you know, in Lorenzo, they all inspired, you know, Mukasa Reese, they were all inspired by what, you know, what she pushed. And they saw the effectiveness of it as young African people organizing in this country. And some of them, you know, uh, some of the greatest organizers that has ever been. When you come, when you talk about, at, you know, uh, radical activism, that's some of the greatest uh, mobilizing organizers that there have been. And so uh, it's always important to, to to uh, back Lorenzo and other elders up who understand a real revolutionary collectivism and not this, not a personality movement, uh, thinking that it always has to be somebody at the top barking down orders, because um, that hadn't proved to be effective ever. And so we want to go with what's being effective, and that's our collective leadership. Well, salute to you on that. Salute on that. Uh, appreciate you for that for that statement again uh, if you want to donate to our efforts we're working in the community cmb dallas at cash shop we appreciate eric the chairman eric for coming out yet again and kind of giving us some uh great detail uh, and historical um analysis that he did gave and talked about our time that we had with Lorenzo Campbell or Irvin. If you're not familiar with uh, Lorenzo Campbell or Irvin and his wife, Jonana, uh, we could probably talk all day about uh, Lorenzo Campbell or Irvin, but you know, we would be re totally remiss if we didn't mention the contributions of Jonana, which one of the many contributions mm -hmm. was he was the last editor of the Black Panther Party newspaper. Uh, go look these people up. The point of this conversation is to kind of expand perspective beyond the information that's kind of commonly out there um, and salute to these elder comrades, uh, whether they see this or not, or at some point in the future, uh, major salute to them. Salute to Ross Mayanga. Thank you mm -hmm. and your wife for coming down and spending time with us here mm -hmm. in the city, in the city of Dallas for the uh, day or two that you came down and we did an event with him as well. And he talked about his experiences in the Marine Corps and the LA chapter of the Black Panther Party. Uh, great conversation we appreciate you all please like share and subscribe it's been a great time i'm your street reporter yafel balagoon appreciate you